My name is Jeff. I am the organizer of the event. Uh, the club is SD Mass, San Diego Marine Aquarium Society. So I wanted to thank you guys for coming. We really do appreciate it. A lot of you make it happen and, and make it the event that it is. So with that, I'd like to introduce the last speaker of the event, Kevin Gaines. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. Well, thanks for uh, coming to the last talk of the show. How many, how many people have been to MACNA before? Yeah, quite a few. So whose first MACNA is it? Oh, well, that's good too. Mostly local? How far, how far did you come? Local. Yeah? New York. New York. All right. Awesome. Well, that, that's great. Uh, we, we like to see these conferences grow. And my first conference, I uh, actually met Mr. Turner here in the second row. It was in 93, yeah. Cleveland. So I, I missed a, a few along the way, mostly during hurricane season and stuff like that. But I've uh, been, been to well over 15 of them, and uh, they really do foster a, a, you know, a good um, feeling for keeping aquariums and the transfer of technology and the stuff we've accomplished. And in the past couple years with breeding and so forth, uh, being on the aquaculture side, it's just been a massive. So I think we're going to see some huge effects in the future from, from what's going on and research, but today I'm going to talk to you about the Coral Restoration Foundation. So uh, this is a nonprofit in the Florida Keys. I got involved with the Coral Restoration Foundation in 2011. I was the operations manager for two years. So I was lucky enough to uh, go out four and five days a week um, on the on the water, six seven miles offshore, uh, working in 30 feet of water most of the time coming up for a short break and putting on another tank and going back down. So I, I logged a lot of bottom time. I learned a lot and uh, was pursuing a, a passion of mine and that is um, to restore Florida's reefs and hopefully beyond. So today's talk is gonna be talking a little bit about the techniques we use to uh, restore coral reefs and um, what, what impact it's having um, across the board with, with science and um, uh, restoration. So first we have a problem. So um, in Florida and globally, we have uh, a lot of issues. So um, corals have been around for a long time. And in the, in the past 40 years, um, we've documented um, substantial loss, especially with hard corals and stony corals. And this has a dramatic impact on the whole topography and ecology of coral reefs. So you probably hear in the news, um, a lot, especially in the past few years, about massive bleaching events and diseases and so forth. So these corals are under tremendous strain um, from a global scale and a local scale. So as you saw, that was a, I'll go back, sorry. Um, so this is a lush thicket of staghorn coral. The Florida Keys and the Caribbean um, only has one species of, of branching coral like this, whereas the Pacific and Diverse regions, there's over 200 species of uh, branching acroporas. So um, when we lose one, it has a huge impact on, on our reef structure. And, and uh, this is the staghorn coral, Acropora cervicornis. And what happens when it dies? We um, left with a complete rubble zone and a habitat that does not foster fish and uh, other sort of um, crustaceans and, and marine life. And in 90% of the stony corals have, uh, especially with the cervicornis, the staghorn corals have, have died. So we're, we have a lot of um, reefs that used to be lush and thick with this species um, now gone. So this three-dimensional structure that this branching coral provides um, as a home for many reef life, marine life, is gone. And so we, we see that impacting um, the whole ecology of the reef. Here's a nice little staghorn uh, patch. Uh, typically staghorn corals found uh, anywhere from 10 to 40 feet of water and um, provides, like I'm saying, a habitat for a lot of fish. And this is uh, what happens when the reef dies. You're left with this rubble zone that kind of by our roads and fish move on. Here's a little sequence here. Carries Fort Reef is a kind of a keystone reef in the upper Florida Keys. Has anyone ever dove Carries Fort? Lou Key? Yeah. So these reefs were dominated with Elkhorn coral almost to the surface of the water um, at low tide. Some of this coral was even exposed. I remember as a kid 
Um, not even being able to swim over to the top, top of the reef at low tide was just, the, the Elkhorn coral was out of the water and it was just littered with um, diadema urchins. And then this dramatic shift happened and we really didn't understand why at the time, um, but uh, it just continues to decline and, and the recruitment of new corals just hasn't happened. So we're left with this bio eroded um, dead zone and a fairly short time sequence, 30 years, and some of these reefs have, have been even more prolific. We've seen these dramatic changes in two or three years. Here's another shot here. This is Lou Key in the, off Big Pine Key in the Florida Keys. Just solid Elkhorn coral, and they're just reduced to this, these nubs of old Elkhorn. Here's a kind of normal uh, hard coral reef with about 60% hard coral cover in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you have massive brain corals there in the middle, mixed staghorn and elk horn, and um, now we see just remnants of the boulder corals, most of the stony corals, the staghorn corals, elk horn corals gone. It's now taking over with soft corals, and, and um, to most people who've never dove this region, they, say, they see activity, they see coral, and they see beautiful, there's some fish, but as you saw in the previous picture, this is a much different reef dominated by soft corals than a stony coral reef. Here's just a little graphic here to show you the, the area that we used to see um, Elkhorn coral found in an aerial shot of um, Carey's Fort Reef. So these areas that are circled, you'd find solid Elkhorn um, throughout the whole fore reef and uh, top of the reef structure. And this is where you find it now, just these little blips of just remaining tiny colonies in these these spur and groove reefs uh, up and down the Florida Keys. So uh, we ask, you know, what, what happened? So all these, this isn't just a Caribbean problem, this is a global problem. This is a, a reefs are under a lot of pressure globally, so we see staghorn corals and, and even other types of corals um, dying globally. So why is this happening? Well, in the Keys, um, the first documented disease, this may have been happening obviously a lot earlier, but scientists just didn't understand it and weren't studying it. So they first really started to document disease in the 70s. Now, white band disease is a, a stony coral disease where the coral tissue just slowly peels off and, and uh, continues to take over and, and kills the animal. Um, 1983 was considered a, a tipping point in the Caribbean in terms of from, from documented history of, of, of the reef, um, we lost pretty much 90 or 99 percent of all the um, sea urchins throughout the Caribbean, from Panama all the way to Bimini, which was unprecedented um, in a very short period of time, maybe a year, nine months, ten months. Um, they still aren't very clear on what it was, um, other than a bacterial or a viral uh, disease, but it had a dramatic impact on the Caribbean. Here you have um, a bleached coral. I think we all know what those look like, just void of uh, zooxanthellae due to mostly high temperatures. And, and white pox is a specific disease that attacks elkhorn coral, the other uh, branching stony coral in the Caribbean with staghorn that, that are primary reef building corals. Water quality is certainly a stressor um, globally from agriculture, from uh, development, and um, lots of other reasons uh, that you see here is a, a plume of green water just from excess nutrients. So this microalgae consumes that nitrogen and blooms and turns the water uh, green and shades out and consumes oxygen. And cold events, especially in the Florida Keys, we've seen uh, cold events have a dramatic impact on, on our reefs. We're on the verge of subtropical in the Florida Keys. But um, for, to see the water go to 58 degrees um, is pretty unprecedented, and that's happened a couple times in the last 30 years. So it's not all heat. Everyone says global warming, global warming. It's these climate change events, these extreme stresses. So in 2010, we had um, 56, 57 degree water roll over the reefs, inshore reefs of the Florida Keys. And being colder and denser, it hugged the bottom. And of course, that's where your, uh, your corals are. So they, they suffered um, dramatic loss. So a little bit more about white pox. Um, this is Elkhorn. These patchy areas uh, show up. It's important for people to understand the, the effects that humans have on, on the coral reefs. Um, 
they started looking at this um, in the early 2000s, uh, James Porter, uh, they started looking at uh, sampling these, these corals for bacteria. And lo and behold, they found Serratia marcescens. And, and what this is is an enterobacterium. Um, they used uh, ribosomal um, DNA to find out, you know, to isolate this. And it um, came back that um, this was a, a bacteria found only in the human gut. So this was the first scientific study that actually had a smoking gun um, to the effects of human waste on, on coral reefs directly, which was a big deal. Uh, they, w they went back and, and they had a lot of challenges on this paper and they restudied it and got the same results. So it's um, definitive that uh, this pathogen is present in uh, sick and dying Elkhorn coral. What's interesting here is um, you can see the decline of the coral cover over this time period is really dramatic. This is specifically palmata, the Elkhorn coral. And where does this uh, waste come from? Well, the Keys specifically had a lot of um, sewer system, or septic tanks in their housings that were built in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And from what I understand, it was um, easier to keep the septic tank in the ground if you punched a hole in it <laughs> because the water table is very shallow in the Keys. At about six feet, you're hitting water and it's hard to make a tank stay in the ground if it's uh, in water. So a lot of them deliberately had holes put in them to stay in the ground. And so that uh, started some, some major contamination from housing. So you basically have these houses in Florida over a very porous limestone, and um, this stuff just percolates right into the waterways. Um, there's also other um, nitrogen and, and phosphates from other runoffs that, that also get into the water table through percolation. So what they did in the study for white pox is they um, actually injected uh, radioisotopes into uh, wells, just like if you were basically flushing it into your sewer system, or your septic tank, sorry. And they found that um, these radioisotopes were visible on the reef within uh, five to seven days, which was pretty dramatic that um, land activities were having a direct impact on offshore coral reefs. Some of these reefs three, four, five miles offshore um, in that little bit of time. And then they did another tracer in another area and it was even short as two days. So these impacts are dramatic. So here's an Elkhorn coral in 94 and uh, still kind of having white pox here in 96 and 98, and last 2000, there's just no, nothing left. One more transect here of Elkhorn. I think we got the picture. <laughs> well, um, we've learned a lot through this process, so there, there's obviously a lot of positivity coming out of this research that, that we just really didn't understand. So now the, the Florida Keys has switched over to sewer systems. There's a lot more water quality monitoring, looking at the right things. Um, even though they were looking at runoff of the Everglades, which is a, um, from mostly agriculture around Lake Okeechobee in southern Florida, they mostly were looking at um, ammonia and, and not looking at nitrite and other precursors, as, as we know, as, as Aquarius happen. So if you're not looking at that stuff, you think the water's clean. But um, yeah, they first started looking at nitrate. They weren't even looking at ammonia or nitrite, and then they started seeing all that. Then they started looking at phosphorus. What this is here is this is a plume of reflectance. Uh, the brighter pink uh, means a higher concentration of algae. And you can see Florida Bay in the top right in the upper keys and, and that whole plume. And this is due to nitrogen and phosphorus runoff that these, uh, these algae um, consume that nitrogen and fluoresce it back through this satellite digital imagery. So um, a lot of water was being released from Lake Okeechobee into the Everglades without a whole lot of understanding of its impact. And, and pictures like these made it clear and correlated to the diseases and loss of coral that we saw during that time period. I know that I was diving a lot in the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s. I'm sure Jeff was as well. And um, the impact during this period when they were releasing all this water was historic. And the ironic part is um, we had some people, uh, you know, writing papers saying that uh, the bay was, um, didn't have uh, enough, it was uh, too, too diluted from fresh water. So 
um, they need, it was hypersaline, so they actually wanted to uh, increase the water flow. And they were in complete denial that there was any issues with uh, the release of these, these um, nitro nitrogenous waters and, and, and runoffs during that time. So here's a shot of some of the canals and, and water processing of all the, the water that they did discharge. And this is just part of the, the Florida water story that has to really kind of be understood to see where we're at. So we have multi um, different outlets of water offshore of uh, Fort Lauderdale. We have sewage outflows. We deep well inject our waste a um, couple thousand feet in the ground below the aquifer to get rid of it because it's cheaper than processing it uh, like we you know, would with a, a normal wet dry type filter, uh, tertiary treatment. So the water is injected deep and it, it comes up in a variety of ways just like that septic tanks in the Keys does. But it costs a lot of money to uh, change the way that this is processed and with the amount of people and the population growth, they're scrambling to try to figure out the, the right way to do it now. So this is a shot of the Everglades and the agriculture we were talking about. Big sugar. Phosphorus and nitrogen levels um, during this time period were extremely high. And this is a boat on Florida Bay after um, the release of these waters in, in the Florida Keys, Florida Bay. You can see it looks like uh, split pea soup. So uh, that's like the, the dissolved oxygen in that scenario is extremely low. Fish suffocate, turtle grass dies off, and it, it becomes a real problem. Macroalgae thrive and overgrow the reefs. And this is all in combination with reefs that now have no diadema to help clean them. So you had massive boulder corals, and they would turn to that in, in, in two years. Boulder corals the size of Volkswagen buses or uh, beetles. <laughs> big, big corals just gone. Was... So these. Uh, they learned really how important the sea urchins are on the reef, um, how they do clean the fore reef and they provide um, clean reef areas for coral settlement as well as keeping uh, macroalgae from overgrowing the reef. So when you don't have them, you have tons of macroalgae. And with the diadema die off and these bleaching events and these water quality releases, it was just, uh, just kind of a triple punch um, with regards to the Florida Reef Track. It wasn't one single thing, but you have disease, you have bleaching, you have the loss of sea urchins on top of uh, human pressures. So um, what happens, as you saw in that one picture, when you're left with just a few corals in uh, very small places, even if they are spawning, they're too far apart from each other to actually fertilize each other. Corals need to um, spawn and release their eggs into the water column and have another genotype of uh, the same species nearby to fertilize. They can't self-fertilize. So without these colonies close to each other, they're spawning, but uh, there's no new recruitment, there's no fertilization, and the corals can't recover. So the remaining populations, um, you know, to, to bring them back, they're just too fragmented. So um, when you have those rubble zones like you saw, even if there is coral to settle there, because it's not stable and it's basically uh, bioeroding, it's not a habitat that's suitable for, for these corals to, to recover on their own. So what is the solution? We've talked enough about the problem, but I felt it's really important for people to understand that there's many, many variables that go into the, the um, Florida water story, but globally the same picture. These are, these are issues that are, um, are, for the most part, some out of our control and some in, but there is a solution. And uh, we large-scale uh, restoration is needed. And um, the Coral Restoration Foundation has uh, come up with some techniques to, to help the Caribbean corals recover and give them that jump start to come back. So um, the Coral Restoration Foundation star starts with a live rock farm. Do many of you know that, that the CRF, the founder of CRF had a live rock farm. He used to be a fish collector. So it's a pretty interesting turnabout that you have someone who's collecting fish um, with a live rock lease that turns out to come up with a, a really viable solution to save the reefs. So we, this, these rocks in the middle of the sand here are an aquaculture bottom lease that he was given um, seven miles offshore of Key Largo. 
So you would take uh, limestone from South Florida uh, from the land, dry, and put it offshore and wait a couple of years and harvest it. Well, what happened is um, in the late 90s, he had coral settle on his live rock. And at that time, the government, the state of Florida, uh, man said that you, whatever lands on your live rock, you can harvest and sell, um, whether it's a stony coral that's protected in the wild or not. Um, and Ken Niedermeyer said, uh, basically, this, he saw the, the, the loss of corals all around uh, when he was collecting. So he saw that this was an opportunity um, to actually keep this coral and start to culture it. And scientists were basically saying, well, you can't do that. And um, Ken looked to the aquarium trade for options and ways to do this with fragging in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when fragging was just becoming um, popular. So we, uh, Ken took cuttings of this coral and um, with his, his daughter on a 4-H project, planted a few corals at Molasses Reef and they took off. And then within two or three years, these corals were thriving. And it showed that this was a viable way to actually start to restore a reef with this species. In 2011, we came up, the coral restoration devised um, a plan to grow corals with a coral tree. And this is basically a PVC network to hang the corals and suspend them. There was much uh, research and time spent growing them on, on the sand, on blocks, and they would get sandblasted in storms. They were more susceptible to predation and other things. So the coral tree really changed how fast we can grow these branching corals. And with that technology, um, you can take these fragments from the tree and uh, plant them on the reef and put them back in zones where they used to occur. And if you know the genotypes of these corals, you can outplant them strategically to uh, create populations that will then spawn, fertilize, and, and start natural recovery, which is the end goal of any restoration. Here's a shot of the staghorn corals uh, on some tree, coral tree nurseries. And started doing elkhorn a few years ago the same way. Used to grow them uh, on blocks on the seafloor. And now they're all suspended on, on monofilament through these coral tree nurseries. So these corals are from uh, four inch fragments in about 14 months. So yeah, that's me. It actually gets cold in, in January in the Florida Keys. Well, cold anyway by my standards, Six, 64. So, and you're not, you're not swimming around a lot. You're on the sand working with corals, so you get quite cold. But um, yeah, the corals grow really, really well uh, using this method. So we can create tens of thousands of fragments in a fa fairly short time. So how do, we, how do we put this into action? Well, last year, as you can see here, um, there was a number 72 dive programs. Um, we outplanted uh, a little over 22,000 corals, um, 1,600 in one day. It was at World Oceans Day. Coral Palooza we do every year, so you guys can come down and get involved. World Oceans Day, we outplant corals uh, from the upper keys to the lower keys, um, and even elsewhere in, in other parts of the Caribbean. So we have uh, over 40,000 uh, corals in our nurseries now. I can't even keep track. We had seven nurseries? Six. Six. Six nurseries, a couple different Elkhorn nurseries, and these, uh, these nurseries now we're able to move genotypes between different um, nurseries and spread out our, our genetic, genetics. So we can, you know, genetic diversity is really the key. So um, we've, we've tried to collect as many different types of staghorn and Elkhorn coral as we can from different areas of the keys, because once you start losing these genetics, they're gone forever. So we don't really know who the survivors are and who you know, can survive in uh, a more a warmer ocean, a lower pH ocean, um, can resist disease. So the whole, whole idea is obviously to, to get as much diversity in our nursery as possible to outplant so we can learn, learn these things. So we have over 120 different staghorn? Yeah, so 120 now different staghorn genotypes alone. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. And they're all um, scientifically genotyped, so we can study them, and other people can come in and study them. And, and they have this basically this underwater laboratory in our nursery 
to do their research. So the three uh, pillars of coral restoration are um, the restoration, um, science, and education. So without these three, you know, you're only basically putting corals out on the reef as restoration. And without the science part, you really aren't learning um, what works and what doesn't. And that's a very expensive endeavor for, for a small nonprofit. So we've partnered with a lot of different um, government and institution NGOs to help uh, support with our, our science component. Um, and of course, education, getting people to understand what uh, little things they can do uh, on a personal basis, whether it's a, a personal decision to, to um, you know, take one step to in, improve their carbon footprint or actually um, go get in the water and actually outplant corals. There's, there's a lot of things we can do, but the first part is helping people understand because a lot of people aren't divers and, and if you don't go in the water and see this stuff, you really don't uh, have any personal impact. You don't really recognize what's going on. Like if, if someone were to clear your tree lot next to your house, you'd be quite um, probably upset about it uh, for no reason. But it, you know, if you look at a, a coral reef and it's lush with corals and then they're, they're just gone. Um, if you've never seen it, then there's no reason to, to want to keep it. So we have to really kind of drive home how important these habitats are globally for a variety of reasons. So some of the success we've experienced, um, these are some, this is an Elkhorn uh, restoration site. So this was uh, March 2015, and in April you have a pretty decent uh, colony size, and then um, September, so that's an Elkhorn outplant. This is uh, <laughs> Brian Adams <laughs> outplanting some Elkhorn in, in Mystique. Does people know who Brian Adams is, the Canadian singer? Yeah, so. He, uh, he found out about our project and he has a house down in the Caribbean and uh, sponsored a restoration nursery and site. And we are um, really happy to have him involved as well as some other Caribbean projects. Here is um, a, a keys shot of some staghorn outplants. This is uh, White Banks. This is a really shallow water site for us. This is um, a site that the World Pet Association, WPA, help to sponsor and restore. These corals are doing really well. This is over um, two years, I want to say. So they're creating uh, this, this habitat once again. So it's, it's, this is the validation of the project. A lot of people say, you know, why are you doing this? You're putting them back. They're struggling. Um, you know, there's no hope for our coral reefs, but we, uh, we you know, feel like you know, we have to do something. And this is working. And so we want to we want to keep staying, you know, giving the reef a chance to come back on its own. This is really a sign of hope. The first big event, too, as well as uh, some of our outplants had spawned sexually in 2009, and this is the first time Caribbean corals had spawned from a documented age of a fragment, and it was as little as two years. So they science didn't even know that these corals could become um, sexually reproductive in two year time. So this was a, a pretty big deal that a, a coral outplanted in 2007 was documented as releasing eggs in 2009. And this is again, the ultimate goal is to get these corals out there so they spawn and get fertilization and recover on their own. These are the little small eggs that they release. They float up to the top and bust open and then they mix with that coral that was next to them that also released their eggs and they have a swimming larvae that settles on the reef in a couple weeks. There's another big colony at our nursery. Uh, this was just a few weeks ago, um, spawning. So they, they spawn twice a year usually, um, three days after the full moon in August and September, but not always. <laughs> but the past few years, it's been like clockwork, and we just started learning about these cycles with these corals specifically. And uh, we have the Florida Aquarium. This is our nursery. Um, we have basically, a, like I said, a living laboratory. So we have uh, the Georgia Aquarium, tenting corals here to collect the eggs and study them. Um, we have the Florida Aquarium. Um, here's some, a tree with some new corals that we're working with. So we've, in the past couple years, we've really tried to diversify some of the corals that we're working with. We have Montastria cavernosa and uh, Orbicella. Um, what else is there? Um, Millipora, the fire coral as well. So 
Um, these are all important uh, reef building species, so we're glad that we're able to expand beyond Elkhorn and Staghorn. This was an Aquarius mission. Uh, there's an underwater laboratory off uh, Tavernier um, in 60 feet of water. And uh, NASA just recently did a project with uh, CRF because they, they use this weightlessness feeling of tasking underwater to train astronauts. And uh, what better than to actually do something productive and uh, frag corals and, and uh, study them. So it was pretty cool to have NASA using our technology and our techniques with our coral trees and a variety of different coral species. So they actually put um, some, some corals out at a few different depths and did some different uh, studying with them. And these are some of the awards that CRF's been uh, recognized for. Of course, Ken Niedemeyer was nominated as a CNN hero in 2012. That was a really big deal. But uh, he's been uh, different wildlife and, and environmental heroes with a variety of organizations. Uh, so we've been really um, lucky to have this sort of recognition because along, obviously, with this recognition and our project comes with some of these funding projects. Um, we just uh, started a, a $2.1 million three-year NOAA collaboration. So uh, we're going to be looking to outplant 60,000 60, corals in three years at 15 different reef sites. Is that right? 15 or eight? Eight. eight. So there's eight sites in the Keys. And um, there's a whole restoration plan, but uh, they're using our techniques and, and um, the monitoring will be followed up with that. But you can go uh, to any of these sites to, to see some more information about the Coral Restoration Foundation and what, what they're doing. And uh, with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs>